الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله تبارك وتعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما المؤمنون إخوة فأصلحوا بين أخويكم واتقوا الله لعلكم ترحمون وقال عليه الصلاة والسلام سبعة يظلهم الله في ظله يوم لا ظل إلا ظله إمام عادل وشاب نشأ في طاعة الله إلى آخر الحديث أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والتسليم Respect to Allah's beloved brothers MashaAllah it's, it's lovely to see the brothers sitting here on a Friday evening Alhamdulillah It's good to see so many brothers Alhamdulillah um, So first of all I want to thank the, the brothers who organized this event MashaAllah it's a new initiative and we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that makes it a success inshallah we all need reminders myself included you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَةَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ that remind one another because reminders they benefit the believers so we all need reminders regularly so inshallah this will be a start of a long series of inshallah nasiha that will go on inshallah for a long time I've been working in um, Belmarsh Pent for quite a few years. Um, Allahu A'lam whether it's for my crimes or whatever, but Alhamdulillah, I'm there. Um, I've been there for quite a few years. Belmarsh, uh, many of you maybe heard of it. It's, um, it's a high security category A prison uh, down, down in South London, South East London. And um, being there... We are there, you know, to, to help the brothers over there to lead Jumu'ah Salah, to do classes and stuff like that. But it's also given me a great insight into, into people, into different brothers, into people who have come from different, different backgrounds. So it's really given me an insight. And it's that insight that I want to share with the brothers sitting here, alhamdulillah. And just... Yesterday, you know, we, we do alhamdulillah, we do classes nearly every day. So just yesterday morning, I was speaking to one brother, and he was telling me about his life and what he's in Belmarsh for, and how much time, how much time he's doing behind bars. So he was telling me he's doing roughly at an eight or ten year sentence, and before that, when he was younger, he also done various crimes, and he ended up in the prison. Then he got released again on bail, on license. Then he done something else stupid and he ended back in again. Now I, I was asking him, you know, what have you learnt in, 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 in this period? So he says to me, oh, what do you miss? So he said to me, you know, Imam, what I miss a lot, of, apart from family and all of that. He said, I phoned my brother, I phoned my family, and my family tell me that they're going to Turkey on holiday. They're going to Hajj, they're going for Umrah, they're, going, they're flying out all these different places and I'm stuck behind bars. I've done one stupid thing, but now I'm stuck here for 10 years. And even when he gets out of prison, he's telling me that I'll be on a license. So the, you know, the police, the probation, they'll put him on license conditions and they will tell him, you know, more than likely he'll have conditions that he's not allowed to fly out for maybe another 8 years. So he's doing 8 years behind bars. But when he gets out for maybe another four or eight years, he'll do with conditions, and part of those conditions is he can't fly out. So he'll be at home, on the road, at home with his family, but his family are going everywhere and he's stuck at home. It just shows the reality of what's, you know, what, what, is, what is there behind bars, what people go through, how they suffer, and how they regret the small things that they have done that now they end up behind bars. At the time, you know, at the time, the brothers tell me, you know, at the time when you're doing these kind of things, there's all a massive hype. That, yeah, we're the man. We're a road man. We want status. We want to be part of a clique. We want to be part of a gang. And we want some status. We want to do something. 
So people know us, look at us, respect us. So at the time, you do something. But later on, maybe the first time you might not get caught. But you do it the second time, the third time, the fourth time. These are the times that Allah gives you chances. That look, you've done it once. You haven't got caught. Allah didn't make you get caught. But listen, go to the masjid. Learn, repent, go back on the straight path. But man does it again. And he does it again. And eventually one day will come when he gets caught. And he will get found guilty of whatever he's done. So those two, three years of madness that he played, of the jahiliyyah that he played around with, has now messed up his whole life. I'll give you another case. Today in Jumu'ah Salah, you know, we're done in the prison, alhamdulillah. So speaking to another brother there. And this brother, alhamdulillah, his, his life has completely changed now in prison, alhamdulillah. But he's telling me, he's doing not 8 years, not 10 years, he's doing 20, sorry, 35 years behind bars. He got a 35 year sentence. And then he tell me all about it, what's happening, and what, how he got there. So, he's been a Muslim for many years. He was a Muslim outside as well. But when he took his shahada outside, when he was younger, he wasn't pray. He took his shahada, alhamdulillah, new Muslim, but he wasn't on to his deen. He didn't take it seriously. So, he was still with that crowd that, you know, likes to hang out, likes the girls coming around, likes the fast money, the exciting life, the quick money. He was in that kind of lifestyle, he tells me. And then he says, we were going around, we had guns, we had everything, we had money, we were going around shooting people, and then people come around trying to shoot us as well. He goes, in that process, he said, you know, on all of their gang turfs and their wars that they have, he ended up killing somebody. And when he ended up killing somebody, I'm not sure whether it was one person or two people, I think it was a double murder. So he killed two people. He got found guilty and he got 35 years for it. He came to prison and he's still in that mode, very angry that, look, you know, I've done all of this. He still wants status, mashallah, strong bro, you know, the muscles this big, you know, like his t-shirt is ripping, you know, good, strong brother, you know, now alhamdulillah. So he's still got that status in the community, when you're in that lifestyle, you have the status, you have the respect, whatever from, from you know, from your peers, and when you go in prison, it's like, you know, for some of them, it's like a stripe on the shoulder, I've been to prison, I've done my time, I've done my five years, it's like a stripe on the shoulder, but later on they realize, that that stripe on the shoulder means nothing. And it's just a bad road down. So he tells me, and he says to me, that after some time, slowly, slowly, as he was in the prison, now he's doing 35 years, after one year, two years, three years, four years, he meets other good brothers in the prison. People who are practicing, people who are doing the salah, people who are learning Quran, people who are learning Arabic, Tajweed, and everything else. So now he started going into his religion. Now he started learning. And then he was telling me, he's now reading the stories of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he's reading the stories of the Sahaba. So he's reading and the Imam is giving khutbahs and he's taking all of this in. And he's listening to it all. And I said, what changed you? What one point in your life can you pinpoint that this is what really, you know, stuck with me? And he told me, he said, the story of Wahshi radiallahu ta'ala an. We've all heard the story of Wahshi radiallahu anhu, yeah? or do you want to hear it? You want to hear it, yeah? Yeah? Awake everybody? Anybody awake? Yeah, we're awake, yeah? Okay, that's good. Okay, the story of Wahshi radiallahu ta'ala an. Wahshi, it's a long story, but basically he was a, a slave in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before he embraced Islam, he was not a Muslim, and he was a slave. Now, the, at the time, the Muslims, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was fighting defensive wars with the Quraysh, the people of Makkah who are trying to attack the Muslims. This is 1400 years ago. So at that time, the masters, the owners, the people who owned Wahshi radiallahu an, they told him that if you kill Hamza radiallahu ta'ala an, who was the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, again a very brave, strong warrior, if you kill him in the next battle, then you will earn your freedom. And which slave doesn't want to get free? Every slave wants to be a free man. Nobody wants to remain a slave for the rest of their life. 
So he said, this is my opportunity. He didn't think, he had no reason, apart from his getting his freedom, he himself had no, had no beef, as they call it, with Hamza radiallahu an. He had nothing against him. He was a slave minding his own business. He, what has he got to do with Hamza radiallahu an, who was a leader, who was a great man? But he said, no, this is the way I'm going to get my freedom. So in the next battle, he kills in the battle of Uhud. Wahshi radiallahu an afterwards, he then killed Hamza radiallahu ta'ala an, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then even the masters, the owners of Wahshi, they even came, she came, and she even mutilated the body of Hamza radiallahu an. That's, the, that, that's a very disgusting act. You know, man's already dead on the floor. You don't then go after that, the dead body, and cut him up and mutilate his body and take out his insides and all that. You don't do that. That's unnecessary. The man's already dead. But they had so much hatred in them that even when they saw the man dead, the enemy dead, according to them, their enemy dead, they still couldn't take it. No, they're still not satisfied. So they had to, you know, kind of cut up his body, cut up his insides and all that kind of stuff they done. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa after the battle, in the battle of Uhud, obviously very upsetting. Who wouldn't be? You see your uncle passed away in front of you in battle. Not only that, the whole body is mutilated and everything else, you know. You know, it's, it's a very, very sad, upsetting moment. That who does that? You know? But anyway, it's happened. They, they buried him. Allah gave him, you know, he's Sayyid al-Shuhada. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave him a great status. But, so that Wahshi, he then received the promise from his master. So he, he became free. He said, okay, fine, you've done your deed. You're a free man now. So now Wahshi, who was a slave, now became a free man. Now when he became a free man, he can think for himself. He doesn't have to listen to his masters. He can do what he wants, go where he wants, think what he wants, do what he wants. You know, he was a free man. So after that, he had friends. Bilal radiallahu anhu was his friend. And others were his friends as well. And he started speaking to people. And later on, Wahshi radiallahu ta'ala an, he saw the beauty of Islam. When he saw the beauty of Islam, when he saw the equality that Islam was promoting, you know, in Islam, we're all equal. Whether we're a man, woman, black, white, Somalian, Algerian, Asian, it makes no difference in Islam. We're all equal. So when he saw this, that Wahshi, he, he, he was black himself, he said, I'm black, I'm amongst all the Arabs, you know, the Arabs think they're more superior than us, but Islam is telling us the Arab is the same as you. You're a black man, you are a slave, but you're, you're, in the sight of Allah, you're all equal. So these notions resonated in his mind. Oh, no, this, this religion I need to look into, I need to look deep. So he studied, and finally, it kicked, it clicked, and he accepted Islam, and he became a Muslim. So Wahshi, the person who killed the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, now becomes a Muslim. And now, when he becomes a Muslim, obviously at the time when you become a Muslim, what are you going to do? You're going to go to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and you're going to take your shahada on the hands of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself. So he does that. So now, when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam hears from the people. That Wahshi is now intending to become a Muslim and he is coming to you to take his shahada. The Prophet wasallam, now as any human being, have, they have mixed emotions. Because on one side, you're talking about the person who killed your uncle, mutilated the body. But at the same time, he wants to embrace and become a Muslim. That's a happy thing. So the Prophet wasallam. Being that great example that we have, he says, let bygones be bygones. Let the past be the past. I know I have that serious you know, emotion against Wahshi. But if he wants to take shahada, then who am I to stop him? Allah is most forgiving. And Allah forgives everything of the past when you take your shahada. So he came to the Prophet wasallam and he took his shahada. And the Prophet ﷺ and the rest of the companions were all excited about it. 
So this story is the story, is one of the stories that hit this brother I'm talking about who's doing a 35 year wreck. He said, look at Islam. It's all about mercy and forgiveness. If people can understand and be able to forgive this much, then this must be the truth. And I need to get more into it. And that's when he started becoming more religious, started practicing, and then started giving da'wah to other Muslims as well. That you know what? All your lifestyle that you've been going through, I've done it all. He's telling me, I've done it all. He had everything. He had the fast cars. He was a strong lad. He had muscle. He had cars, women coming around, drugs, guns, everything. He had it all. But now he's doing a 35-year wreck. And now he's clicking home. That No, that's not the way. So he, he, he wasn't even 35 years old when he got the 35-year 35 35 sentence. Imagine that. You're not even that old and you get a sentence higher than your own age. And then he's telling me, in the prison, when you come there, outside, you might have bags of money. You might have even stacks of money. Enough. But when you come behind bars, when you first arrive, you have £2.50 to spend a week. That's it. The kids of today get more than £2.50 a week. But when you're behind bars, you're an adult grown-up man, all you got is, obviously they provide all your food and all that anyway, but for your own spending, you got £2.50, that's it. From that, you got to buy whatever sweets, chocolates you want, toilet reads that you want, you got to buy some phone, pin credit to phone your home and family and stuff like that. £2.50, you're living on £2.50. It's not easy. It's not easy. But then some people might say, yeah, but my friends and my family from outside, they can send me money. And when they send me money in the prison, you know, through the right channels, then I can spend that money. Uh -uh. Hang on there, hang on your horses, wait. Even if your family send you a hundred thousand pound, it makes no difference. Still the prison rules kick in and they still tell you, you still can't spend more than 15 pounds a week. The maximum you can spend, even though you may have 50,000 pound in your account in the prison, you can't spend more than 15 pounds a week, that's it. So then after that, things click. And I've met some other very rich people, some other people not involved in um, kind of these kind of crimes, but other people who are, who are now doing 20, 30 years, but they were very rich. They had, you know, they, had, they were rich about, without the drugs and all that. They were, you know, they had property, they had shops, they had businesses, you know, all halal stuff, you know. They done another stupid crime, but in terms of their money, that was all halal. They had businesses, shops, property in South London, all sorts, you know, so, you know, they were, they were millionaires. One of their properties is a million pound, they got 10 properties. One of their shops is worth 2 million pound, they got, you know, 15 shops. You know, they were filthy rich people, halal money, alhamdulillah, no problem with the money. It's halal. And so, they, but because they were so rich outside, they were living a life. You know, they were living that life. And now he tells me, now I'm living of 15 pounds a week. I used to spend like 15,000 pounds a day and now I'm living off 15 pounds a week. So that is when the reality kicks in. That now all of that, then you think, you know what? All of that was a waste of money and a waste of time. If I, and he says, when I get out, if I've still got that much money, then I will use it in the right way. I wouldn't just waste it. I would give some sadaqah, give some charity, help the masjid, help the poor, you know, help people abroad, whatever else you know you can do, but spend it in a better way. There you live, there you learn. So these are all people who have been through life, made the stupid mistakes, and now they're behind bars. And they are telling me this, that no, we don't want to go back to that lifestyle. It's not worth it. And many a times, Especially in, you know, when you're a road man and you, and, and you get, you know, mixed up with the wrong gang and you're in one gang and the other gang is in a different area. You're in the N16 gang and that's the N1 gang and you're fighting each other and you're having these wars against each other. He said, it's not worth it. And he goes, most of the time when we are fighting each other and stabbing each other and, you know, shooting each other, it's not even for personal reasons. It's you in part of a bigger gang, there's 50 of you, and there's 50 of them in the other gang, and some member of that gang has shot some member of your gang, but really nothing to do with you personally. But that 
gives uh, no, that makes an obligation on you to now go and shoot that person. But really, it's got nothing to do with you. And then when you end up doing it, you're going to have to do the bird behind bars. So you just done one shot, killed someone, or attempted to kill someone, or even carried a firearm for somebody else, maybe for doing something else. You're doing 15 years behind bars. Who wants to do that much time? The precious years of your life. When you're 15, 20, 25, 30, you've got energy, you've got youth, you've got intellect, you're healthy, you're strong. These are not the years you want to do behind bars. These are the years that you want to do in the community, with your family. Eating with your family, you know, just simple things. We just think it's so simple. But sitting down, young man, young girl, sitting with your mom, sitting with your dad, sitting with your brothers and sisters, eating a meal in the evening, trust me. That's bliss. That's bliss. Because when that goes away, you will realize. That's when they realize. That, yeah, I had my mom. She was caring for me so much. I had my dad. I had my brothers and sisters and uncles. They were all looking out for me. And now, I chose a different path. And I'm suffering, but they are also suffering. So sometimes, the things we do, we think that, yeah, we're going to be the bad boy. We're going to be the man. We're going to have status. But it's not only going to affect you, it's going to affect your whole family. Your whole family. Now, these same brothers who are behind bars, some of them, some of them are married. Some of them, if they're doing a long sentence, that means that their wife, maybe their children, if they've got children, are having to wait for them for eight years, for ten years. She didn't do anything. She's completely innocent. What did she do? No crime. What did the kids do? Nothing. But it's the kids and the wife that have to suffer when the husband is behind bars. Or if you're young and you're still living with your parents, it's your parents. Think about them. They're the ones who are going to be crying on the musalla every day for you. They probably still do it. Even when you're outside, parents always worried about their children. And they make dua for the safeguard of their children. But when the children do something stupid and go behind bars, then the parents suffer. Then the parents suffer so much they've just lost their child. And now they have to support their child who's behind bars. They have to go visit them out of hours, take days of work, go travel so far away. You know, some of them finding, you know, some of our elder parents maybe can't even, you know, have difficulty in walking or traveling. But now they have to travel from all the way from West London, all the way to East London or South East London to go visit people in Belmarsh and all over the show. So it's not fair. It's not fair that the parents and the wives and the children have to suffer for the stupid things that we do. Whereas, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, if you remember, <coughs> when he arrived in Medina Munawwara, yeah, when he migrated from Makkah Mukarramah, he migrated to Medina Munawwara, about 250 miles away, quite far apart. In those days, there's no cars, no trains, nothing like that. You go on camelback, you go on horseback. That's how you travel. Now, when he migrated, him and the majority of the companions, they migrated from Makkah to to Medina. Now, in those days, think about it, 1400 years ago, you're in the deserts of Arabia. You've got no cars, you've got no trains, no planes, you've got no credit cards, no cash money. Yeah, you've got gold coins and silver coins, but no notes that we have today. No bank cards, nothing like that, no phones. But now, you are having to migrate from Makkah and go to Medina Munawwara and leave everything behind to migrate because of the persecution from the Quraysh. And now, understand that once you've migrated to Medina, you have left behind your house. You can't carry your house with you. You've left behind most of the things that are in your house. You can't take that with you. You've left behind your shops, your businesses, your farms, your orchards. Everything is behind in Makkah Mukarrama. You can't take that with you. All you can take with you is what you can carry with you on that camel. That's what you take. So when you get to Medina Munawwara a few weeks later, having traveled 250 miles across the blazing desert, when you get there, in a way you've got nothing. You've just got your traveler. You've just got like one rucksack. That's it. So the Prophet ﷺ understood that the Muhajirun, the people who migrated, they're going through great hardship. And... The local people of Medina Munawwara, they're the residents. They live there, they've been living there. They've made up their life. Some of them are still poor, some of them are rich. They've got their families, they've got their businesses, everything. 
So when the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina Munawwara, you know one of the first things he done? You know, he built a masjid. After building the masjid, he started giving the khutbah, he started giving nasiha to the people. And you know one of the first nasiha he gave to the people? He said to them, and in this address, in, in, this, in this khutbah, he addressed the Ansar. The Ansar were the people who lived in Medina Munawwara, the locals. He addressed them, and he said to them, Look, your brothers and sisters from Makkah Mukarramah have come to you. Your brothers and sisters, remember the wording, your brothers and sisters have come and traveled far away, left everything behind, and have come to you in Medina Munawwara. I would like you, and he's addressing the local Ansar, the, the people from Medina, he's telling them, I want you to look after one of your brothers who have migrated. So I want every one of you here who is local to look after one brother, one sister who has migrated from Makkah Mukarramah. And in Arabic they call it Akha. Akha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Bainul Muhajirin wal Ansar. He created a brotherhood. He created a brotherhood between the Muhajirun and the Al Ansar. And amazingly, the Ansar and all, all the Sahaba, they were willing to listen to the advice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When they used to hear one hadith, you know we hear so many hadith every day. There they hear one hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they're thinking of ways of how can we act upon that hadith. This hadith is not just about listening to, how do we act upon it. So as soon as they heard this nasiha, they said that's it, this is our opportunity. So the local Ansar, they, they found a muhajir, that, have you just traveled? I don't know you, I've never met you before, but you've just traveled here from Makkah Mukarramah, you be my brother. You are my responsibility. You come home with me tonight. You got no place to stay, you're staying at my house. You got nothing to eat, you're eating my food. You got no, no, no clothes to wear, you come into my house, I'll give you some clothes. You haven't had a shower, you come to my house, I'll give you a shower, I'll give you everything. This is how they were. They, were, they literally didn't meet the man before, but today they became like blood, blood brothers because of the nasiha of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is one amazing story about Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas and Abdurrahman ibn Awf. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, he was Ansar. He was from Medina Munawwara. He was quite a rich Sahabi companion. Abdurrahman ibn Awf, he was from Makkah. He was a Muhajir, came. So Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, he grabs the hand of Abdurrahman ibn Awf and he says, you, you're mine. I'm looking after you. You're my brother now. You come home. He takes him home and he says to him, Whatever I've got, a brother loves for his brother what he loves for himself. What is that? A brother loves for his brother what he loves for himself. A sister loves for her sister what she loves for herself. That's how it works. So he said, look, whatever I have, you are now my blood brother. Whatever I have, I'm going to split in half. You take half. I keep half. Just like that. If I have two houses, you take one, I take one. If I've got two farms, you take one, I take one. If I've got 40 camels, you take 20, I take 20. If I've got 100 horses, you take 50, I take 50. Just as, as, as quick as that, as easy as that, they are willing to give. And the best part of it is, the best part of it is, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas says to Abdurrahman ibn Awf, he says, you know what? I'm splitting everything in half, innit? So, I've got two wives. You take one, I'll keep one. Literally, he said that. And he said to him, you know what? You look at both of my wives, and whichever one of them you, 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 know, you like, you tell me, I will divorce that one, and once her period is finished of waiting, then you can marry her. This was the sacrifice and the brotherhood that the Ansar had with the Muhajirun. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, he is a companion, he smiles and he says to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, he says, listen, I thank you really a lot. I appreciate what you've given me. But you know what? You keep what you have lawfully earned for yourself. That's all yours. You've earned that. You've worked hard. It's all yours. I don't want anything of yours. May Allah reward you for your good intention. But 
All I'm asking you is show me the way to the market. Show me the way to the market. And, and Sa'ad ibn Biwaka shows him where the Medina market was. Abdurrahman ibn Uf goes to the market and he starts doing business. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts barakah in the hand of Abdurrahman ibn Uf and he becomes also very, very rich and very, very wealthy over a period of time. And then he spends again in a good way in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the message of this story is the brotherhood that, that Islam ensured between everybody, regardless of race, background, language, color, culture. It doesn't matter. All that is irrelevant. The moment we take our shahada, we are brothers. We are, you know, we are like one. We are one body. We can't cope with somebody else in pain and somebody else aching. No. And, no, and worse than that is us giving somebody else pain and suffering. How can that be? How is that possible? And what really hurt me a few days ago or a few weeks ago, what really hurt me was <clears throat> in the news it came that there was a brother whose name was Siddiq Kamara. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. He was in the news a few weeks ago. He was the person who in Kambo was stabbed and he died because of the stabbing. His name was Siddiq Kamara. He was a Muslim. He was a Muslim. He was actually in Belmarsh a few months before that. He didn't Juma with us. He was with us. We knew him. He goes to court. He gets found not guilty of the charge that he was accused with. He goes on road. You know, we're not here to judge people, but he continues with his own old lifestyle. He gets mixed up with the wrong crowd. He does things that he shouldn't do. And then certain other members of other gangs find him on the road somewhere, stab him up, and he's now passed away. It's sad that Muslim brothers are involved, seriously involved in stuff like this. They say he was a drill rapper. He used to do rap music, which is something Islam doesn't really recommend. We don't get into rap and music. But he was a drill rapper. He used to do music. He used to do raps that kind of encourages violence. And he used to go on YouTube and kind of mock people from his other gang and stuff like that. And obviously the other gang are not going not gonna to like it. So when they saw him next time on road, they saw it out. But we are talking about Siddiq Qamara. Who rahmatullahi alayhi, who's passed away, we, we make a dua to Allah that Allah forgive him. And Allah give him Jannah inshallah. Every Muslim we pray the same. That Allah forgives all of their sins inshallah and give him Jannah inshallah and give sabr to the family. That's one part of the story. The other part of his story, which is even more shocking, is you know he was in Belmash and he was accused of a crime. He went to court, he went to court and he got found not guilty of that crime. You know what that crime was? He was accused of murder. He was accused of murder, but you know who he was accused of murdering? He was accused of murdering somebody else called, I think it was Abdul Rahman Muhammad. So Siddiq Kamara, a Muslim brother, is accused of murdering Abdul Rahman Muhammad, another Muslim. See, you just think, what world are we living in? What world are we living in? Where one Muslim is accused of murdering another Muslim. Yes, on this particular case he was found not guilty. Allahu A'lam whether he did it, he didn't do it, whether the police had enough evidence or not. Allahu A'lam, we don't know. But the fact that he was accused of doing that. And when you think back 1400 years ago, when the Sahaba, they were willing to give half of their possessions and their life to their brother who they haven't even met before. But today, 1400 years later... We are fighting and killing one another. This can't be happening. This can't be happening. We need to become like the Sahaba. And this, this, this brother um, who's doing the 35 years in prison, let me tell you another part of his story. He says when he was on road, you know, involved in all the madness and the guns and the drugs and everything else, he said one of his friends, he didn't give me his name, but he said one of his friends told him, Come, let's go. There's a job that we need doing. And when they mean job, you know what I mean. But you know, when, when they do jobs, you know, yeah, let's go. So he said, okay, fine. Let's go. Let's do this. 
So they got ready, they got in the car, and they went. Or well, he told him, meet me at this place. Now, what this brother in prison who's doing 35 years, what he didn't know is that is all a, it was all a setup. Just to lure this guy to a certain area, and when he drove his car to that area, the other gang, the opposite gang members, they were waiting for him with serious ammunition and guns. And they started firing at the car, left, right, center. Enough bullets. But for some reason, Allah saved this brother and he managed to escape that situation. You know, and he, he, he wasn't killed. But he could have easily been killed. In an ambush, basically. So now, imagine what's going through the head of this guy. My friend just set me up to die. My friend just set me up to die. He set me up. He sent me to that place. You know, colliding with the other gang so they can shoot me up. But Allah saved him, he didn't die. And now, after some time, he does a crime, he, gets, he goes to prison. Now when he gets to prison, when he gets to prison, he finds out from his sources that, that his so-called friend who set him up is also in prison. He's also in the same prison. So imagine what's going through his head. He said, my heart was pounding. The moment I see him, I'm going to sort him out. How dare my friend stitch me up and set me up to die and leave me there rotten. Wait till I see him. That's, go that's going through his head. Wait till I see him. He's finished. I'm going to finish him up. Remember what I told you? This guy, I don't want to receive a punch from that guy. Yeah? That guy's got muscles this big, honestly. He's a really strong brother. So he was determined to sort that guy out. But then, another, another person, another brother... Tells this guy, you know what? That guy is a Muslim. That guy who at that time set you up to die, he's a Muslim. And now this brother, again, he's going through these emotions. He goes, no, no, no. He can't. He's just thinking to himself, it can't be. No. This guy, I'm killing this guy. He's got no chance. But he's a Muslim. No, no, you can't be a Muslim. The Muslims don't set up other Muslims. And he's making all the excuses he can in his mind to kind of, you know, take away the aspects that he's Muslim so he can sort him out. But at the end of it, he realized and other brothers told him, no matter what you think, no matter what excuses you're going to give, that guy's a Muslim. If he's a Muslim, then a Muslim cannot lay hands on another Muslim. And Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, Allah opened his heart and he forgave that Muslim. He forgave that person. That person, what did he do? He set him up to die. He got shot out in the car enough times. But he survived by the will of Allah. And now, he's brought it upon himself to be like the Sahaba and to forgive. Imagine, that was such a great step in his life. He could have done all sorts to that person. He had power, he was strong, he had friends, he had muscles. But he chose to forgive him for the sake of Allah. So that's the message he was giving me. That everybody needs to remember. Whenever you have problems, whenever you have beef, whenever you are angry with another brother, remember the story of Wahshi and many other stories. Where the Prophet وسلم, for the sake of Allah, chose to forgive. Although it hurt him really much in his heart, he said, no, I'm going to leave that all, I'm going to forgive. And once you bring yourself up to that position to be able to forgive, then you will see the nur of Iman come in your heart. Then you will have a different outlook to life. You'll see people differently. Imagine if you go down that life, he was saying, you go down that life of guns and crime and, uh, and drugs and easy money and quick money and knives and everything else. You got all of that. You might have all of that, but you can't sleep straight. You can't sleep peacefully. So you don't know at what time of the night someone's going to come knock down your door. It could be one of the other rival gang members or it could be the feds coming down to take you. You don't know. So you can't even sleep straight. And even when you're awake, when you're going on the road, when you're driving, you're always looking over your shoulder. You don't know which other gang member is after you. You have to look out for your back. Or you don't know the cops might be after you. So you're always looking over your shoulder. When you're awake, 
You're looking over your shoulder. When you're asleep, you can't even sleep peacefully. You think, what kind of life is that? What kind of life is that? And he's saying, what people don't understand is the simple life is the best life. The simple life is the best life. And let me give you one, one verse of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم زين للناس حب الشهوات من النساء والبنين والقناطير المقنطرة من الذهب والفضة والخيل المسومة والأنعام والحرث ذلك متاع الحياة الدنيا والله عنده حسن المآب It's a beautiful verse and what he's talking about is the material things of this world that people find beloved their desires, whether it's women, whether it's gold and silver, whether it's, you know, in those days, camels and horses, or in these days, fast cars, money, all of this status, people find that very amusing. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ذَلِكَ مَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ dunya. He said, these are all just things of the world. They mean nothing. وَاللَّهُ عِنْدَهُ حُسْنُ الْمَآبِ Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got the best reward reserved for you in the next life. So don't just look at this world now. Don't just see the fast cars that you see driving people driving here. Don't just look at all the Gucci clothes that people are wearing now. Don't, don't just look at the Ray-Ban and the Armani clothes that people are wearing now and think this is it. I want to be like that guy. He's got all the best clothes and the richest you know, uh, sneakers and everything else. No. وَاللَّهُ عِنْدَهُ حُسْنُ الْمَآبِ What Allah has reserved for each and every one of us on the day in Jannah is far greater than anything here. And we even learn from other ahadith that when a person, when a Muslim goes to Jannah, when a Muslim goes to Jannah paradise and he tastes the beautiful fruit of paradise or he, or he, get, he, he receives any of the other bounties of Jannah, he will be asked that do you remember or do you miss anything about the world? And in the world he could have had everything. He could have had all the luxuries. He could have had all the beauty and everything of the world. But the moment he has that one bite of that one apple in Jannah, he will forget everything of the world. He will think that one bite of that one apple in Jannah is far tastier, far greater, far sweeter than I have ever had in the whole world. So everything that I had in the world means nothing. That one bite was just bliss. Oh, that's Jannah. And that is what is waiting for you and I, inshallah. Inshallah. So that is what we need to be looking towards. We need the Jannah. We, li we live the simple life here, but we get the great life in the next life. That's a Muslim. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even said, A dunya sijnun lil mu'min wa jannatul kafir. A dunya sijnun lil mu'min wa jannatun lil kafir. Which means that this world can seem like a prison for a believer, but a paradise for a disbeliever. This world can seem like a prison for a believer, but like a paradise for a disbeliever. Why? You know, I just mentioned all the stories about, you know, pr prison and what, what, what people have to go through. But this world for a Muslim is, can seem like that. Allah tells us, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to pray five times a day, you have to fast in the month of Ramadan, you have to do all of this, you have to wake up for Fajr Salah at 3 o'clock in the morning. All of these things you have to do. And on top of that, Allah says, you can't do this, and you can't do that, and you can't do this, and you can't do that. And that's all the things that we want to do, but we can't do. So it's kind of like a prison that we're restricted from doing certain things. But that's the world for you. That's the world for you. But our, our real world is when our eyes close, we pass away, we cross the bridge to the next life, and we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is happy with us, and he gives us the key to Jannah, inshallah. That's what we want to get. So let's not, so the message of this hour is let's not, let's learn from the mistakes of other people. Other people are already behind bars. 
There's over 12,000 Muslims in prison. 12,000 Muslims in England prisons. That's a lot. 12,000 more. Maybe there's 13 or 14,000 now. It's too many people. Trust me, we don't want any more. We don't want any more. Stay. Lead a simple life. Stick with the Quran. Learn from the brothers who are already behind bars, telling us the stories that, look, my life in the past is not worth it. I would never do it myself. And I don't want it for anybody else. Tell the brothers outside. Do what they do. Stick with the Imam. Go to the masjid. Lead a simple life. Even though you may not become rich by selling drugs and getting all the money in the world, it doesn't matter. Just work normally, earn halal money. Whatever little money you earn, it will be halal, it will be barakah in that money. Live your simple life, go to sleep peacefully, live with your family, go fly out and go on holiday whenever you can, Allah give you barakah, and just live that life. And in the next life, you'll have everything. So let's learn from those, inshallah. Let's learn from those people, inshallah. So we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He accepts whatever we have said, whatever we have heard, inshallah, and enables us to read the Quran and the Sunnah to act upon it in the real way, to with the true understanding, and to learn from you know to learn from the brothers who are giving us this nasiha from behind bars that don't follow my way. Do your you know, do your own thing, stick with the masjid. You know, I was so happy when I came to this masjid, seeing so many brothers here, but also when I came downstairs. I don't live too far from here, but I don't visit this masjid very frequently. But when I came downstairs to the ground floor, on the side, there was that you know, pool room and uh, table tennis or whatever it was. Honestly, my heart was happy. My heart was happy that these youngsters are in the masjid playing pool. That is far greater than being in some corner street with your own gang and doing your own thing. Be in a masjid. Even though you're playing pool and cricket and football and table tennis, do that. So I'm so happy that this masjid is facilitating for, for, for things for the youth to do. Get involved. Do it. Stick with the masjid. Stick with the good brothers. Pray your five times salah and just live that normal peaceful life, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. And lastly, like the Prophet used to say, فَلْيُبَلِّغِ shahid al ghaib The brothers who are sitting here, please pass on the message. Please pass on the message. What you have heard here, don't keep it to yourself. Pass on to your brothers, to your sisters, to your cousins, to your children, the mothers upstairs maybe, you know, tell your children, pass on this message. That no, we've just heard from the Imam of Belmarsh, and this way is like behind bars, this word and the is from the brothers, this is the road we want to take. And uh, alhamdulillah, there's uh, a lot of, um, I think, Somalian brothers here. The Somalian brothers we have in Belmarsh, Something that's, that's really good about the Somalian community, community is they know the Quran. They can read the Quran and they've memorized one, two, three Jews of the Quran. And they may have you know, done a few crimes and stuff like that and behind bars, yes. But they come, they know Juz Am, they know Juz Tabarak, they know Juz Qad Sami'. Alhamdulillah, that's amazing. So you've got talent, Alhamdulillah. The Somalian brothers, Alhamdulillah. I'm sure others as well, but I'm just talking about the ones that I've met. You've got talent, you've got intellect. Allah has given you the ability to memorize Quran. If you can memorize two Jews of the Quran by the time you're 10 years old, you can do the whole Quran. Easy. Trust me, easy. And all of these brothers that come say, Imam, you know, now they're, now they're 20 and 25 and 30. They say, Imam, you know, they come to our Quran classes and they say, Imam, you know, my mom taught me this. I went to Madrasa and I learned two Jews, but I, you know, I haven't read it for the last 15 years because I left Madrasa, I left home. You know, I haven't read it for 15 years. You know, and they come to a class for a few weeks and they pick it up all again and they, and they read it. We get so happy and we, they continue memorizing. So they're saying, if we had stayed stuck with what our mother told us and sent us to Madrasa and learned the Quran, we wouldn't be here. So you've got talent, all of you brothers, you've got talent. Whether you're young children here, whether you're middle aged, whoever you are, learn the Quran, stick with the Quran, memorize the Quran. أكتب عند القرآن مي الله سبحانه وتعالى اكسبت وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين وما علينا إلا البلاغ جزاك الله خير السلام عليكم ورحمة الله